Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Queen Mary. Um, it's good to see so many of you have braved the depths of uh, this notorious no-go area. <laughs> I was thinking on the way here that for all of Mile End's faults, it has the distinct advantage of being the only place in London you won't bump into Paul Scully. Um, my name is Tom Chidwick, and at this point I'd normally say uh, I'm the manager of the Mile End Institute or as my mother-in-law insists on calling it, the Mile High Institute. <laughs> um, but tonight I've been transformed. I'm the co-director of the Aqu uh, Edward Heath Academic Forum. <laughs> now, what is the Edward Heath Academic Forum? <laughs> I can, you, can, you can tell the trustees of the Charitable Foundation are in tonight. Um, the forum, which will be co-directed by myself and uh, my Queen Mary colleague, Professor Tim Bale, um, at the invitation of the trustees of the Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation is a new scholarly network to encourage the study of conservative politics in the 1970s and indeed the contribution that Sir Edward Heath made to British, European and global politics during his uh, half a century long political career. As Peter Hennessy once said, Edward Heath is the post-war Prime Minister most in need of rescue and repair. And fortunately for, uh, for this new forum, Peter thinks he's also the easiest to be so rescued. And to that end, this event is the first in what we hope will be a semi-regular series of public events and seminars hosted here at Queen Mary University of London, uh, and indeed at Arundel's, Sir Edward's beautiful home in the close of uh, Salisbury Cathedral, which is open to the public from March until November, if you happen to find yourself in, in lovely Wiltshire. Um, and tonight we're going to be taking you back to the infamous Who Governs election of February 1974, which was held on this day 50 years ago, when an embattled Conservative Prime Minister presiding over an increasingly broken Britain, enduring fierce industrial action and rising prices, went to the polls seeking a refreshed mandate and clear authority. All sounds familiar, doesn't it? As we'll see over the course of the, uh, the next hour or so, the election held during a deep winter against the backdrop of a three-day working week and, as I say, fierce industrial action. Not to mention the fact that, as I found out this afternoon, Devilgate Drive by Susie Quattro was number one in the charts. Uh, it was a moment of acute crisis for modern Britain. And in the words of the National Institute Economic Review that year, Britain found herself confronted with the possibility of a simultaneous failure to achieve all four main economic policy objectives adequate economic growth, full employment, satisfactory balance of payments, uh, and indeed reasonably stable prices. And as Britain flickered as a lights on, lights off nation, Edward Heath eventually decided to go to the polls on the 28th of February, rather than the 7th, as many of his advisers favored. Although Lord Butler told me on the way here that he thought the preference was for the 31st of January. So we can explore that over the next hour. Both Thursdays. <laughs> And, and Ted called on voters to express what he called the true and familiar voice of Britain, the voice of moderation and courage. And the election saw Ted up against Harold Wilson for the third and penultimate time with what my uh, friend Lee David Evans, the John Ramsden Memorial Fellow at the Mile Institute, describes as a supporting cast of some of the most vibrant figures in post-war politics. And while Edward Heath is now commonly remembered as the old curmudgeon of post-war prime ministers, observers noted that he was more relaxed and more amusing than in 1970, um, with the Nuffield election study for that year, recording that he spoke eloquently, often without notes, displaying great versatility and grasp of detail. Indeed, the Daily Mail forecast a handsome win for Heath the night before polling day. He was not, however, entirely free from what our, uh, our late Queen Mary colleague John Ramsden called the combination of the fastidious and the stubborn that defined him. As Ramers himself witnessed, uh, Ted visited two London marginals shortly before polling day and attracted a large audience for a public meeting to which he read a stern and John thought uncompromising but surprisingly well-received lecture on the energy crisis. Later in the evening, he then went to the Conservative Club ostensibly to encourage the party workers who had been knocking on doors all night. But he then so steadfastly refused to talk to any of them that they all left a great deal less hopeful than they were when he arrived. <laughs> and while Heath and his inner advisers havered over the date of an election, 
a new register of voters was due to take effect on the 16th of February, and they thought it would give them an unfair advantage to go to the polls before then. He concluded that the election would regressively be sharp and strident, but necessary, indeed virtually inevitable. For Douglas Hurd, his political secretary, uh, who favoured holding the election on the 7th of February, before the overtime ban by the coal miners turned into a full-blown strike, the Prime Minister reminded him of Queen Elizabeth I, fencing with her advisers over the decision to execute Mary, Queen of Scots. And as he recorded in his diary an end to promises, the advisers argued cogently for execution, while the Queen's instinct was the other way. And he concluded that she led them a pretty dance before the bloody deed was finally done. We're in for a real treat tonight with this stellar panel of eyewitnesses and historians including one of those advisors, as I mentioned earlier, Lord Butler of Brockwell, who was private secretary to Edward Heath and his successor, Harold Wilson, between 1972 and 1975. And alongside Robin, we're delighted to be joined by Lord McNally, Tom McNally, who has come fresh from the House of Lords to be here and was James Callaghan's political advisor throughout this period. Um, as well as that, we're delighted to have Dr Robert Saunders, reader in uh, modern British history here at Queen Mary, and given that he has to work with me every day, the long-suffering co-director of the Mile End Institute. Mm. Um, and we were supposed to be joined, as many of you will have seen on the listing, by Sarah Morrison, the uh, vice chairman of the Conservative Party between 1971 and five, uh, and Edward Heath's closest friend. But she sends her apologies and said she's, uh, she's with us in spirit. When I spoke to her on the phone this morning, she was particularly cross about the fact that she thought she knows more about Ted Heath than any of us in this room. <laughs> and that she'd be correcting everything that we got wrong over the next hour. Undoubtedly. Thank goodness she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our, our distinguished panel is going to talk for about an hour or so. Uh, and then we will take your questions about this monumental moment in British political history. And then after that, we hope that you'll join us in, uh, in the foyer downstairs for a drink to celebrate the, uh, the advent of this new partnership between Queen Mary and the Sir Edward Heath Foundation. So without any further ado, over to Professor Tim Bale. Okay. Can I just echo um, Tom's thanks to all of you for coming out on um, what is not great night weather-wise, uh, and it's great to see so many of you here. I also want to thank Tom for putting that earworm into my head. Uh, I was eight years old, I think, at the time, so I do remember Devilgate Drive by Susie Quattro, and it's now echoing around my head. So I'm hoping that tonight we can make the events of February 1974 come alive. Nah, not enough of you got that joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we we're going to start off with uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Rob Saunders, who's going to set the scene for us. Uh, and then we will have uh, uh, some reflections from uh, Lord Butler and then Lord McNally. And then we will uh, have a discussion uh, among the panel and then we'll throw it open to you for Q&A. So, Rob. Right. I'm... Uh... I'm tempted to suggest that we should start off this evening um, by turning out the lights, switching off the heating, <laughs> setting off the fire alarm. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But if we want to understand this election, we do have to recapture one crucial idea. The idea that triggered the election, that dominated the campaign, and that shaped how all of the main parties talked and campaigned. And that is the idea of crisis. If we look at the party manifestos in 1974, it's striking that they all centre on this idea of crisis. We have the Conservatives talking about the grave crisis now facing the nation. The Liberals talking about the immediate economic and social crisis for which no one can offer easy remedies. The Labour Party even... Oh dear, I don't know what I've done there. <laughs> Talk of turning the lights out. <laughs> The Labour Party even called its manifesto Labour's way out of the crisis. This is one of the few elections in British history that happens under a state of emergency. And that is one of five states of emergency in the course of that parliament. It happens during an energy crisis when shops and businesses 
are functioning for part of the week by candlelight. There are terrorist attacks during the campaign. I don't think there's another election in British history where the sense of apocalypse is so central to what all of the parties are talking about. So I'm going to try and give you a whistle-stop tour before handing over to those who were actually there. Now, we might ask why there's an election in this context at all. Ted Heath could have waited until the summer of 1975. This parliament still had nearly a year and a half left to run. The Conservative Party had a majority, and that majority was holding together. So this was, to some extent, a war of choice. Although it's a choice to which he felt driven by the pressure of events. Usually when prime ministers call an early election, it's because things are going well and they think that they're going to take advantage of that. So there's clearly a very different set of dynamics in play here. <coughs> so how would it come to this? Well, here is our central figure this evening, the Conservative Prime Minister, Edward Heath, looking uncharacteristically cheerful. <laughs> and he's looking cheerful because Heath had come to power in 1970 on an extraordinarily ambitious prospectus. He talked about a quiet revolution, a change so radical, a revolution so quiet and yet so total that it would change the course of history of this nation. He was going to unleash the free market, reform industrial relations, join the European community, transform local governments, rewrite the tax system. And this was a government that did genuinely big things, sometimes, as with the Industrial Relations Act, triggering extraordinary levels of opposition. But increasingly, that government had been consumed by firefighting, and in particular, by a whole set of interlocking challenges. So there's an economic crisis marked by spiralling inflation, rising unemployment, and increasingly toxic industrial relations. I won't uh, overburden you with slides, but I think this is quite a telling one. If we look at the number of working days lost in strikes from 1950 onwards, you can see that something quite fundamental is changing in the early 1970s. There's a sense of a, a whole model of industrial relations that is breaking down. Alongside that, of course, there is the crisis in Northern Ireland. In terms of the death toll, the Heath government experiences the bloodiest years of the Troubles. It's on Heath's watch that we get things like Bloody Sunday, internment, the collapse of the Northern Irish Parliament, the start of the IRA campaign on the British mainland. And one of the great questions around Northern Ireland in British politics has always been, is it an anomaly or is it a signpost? Is this just somewhere fundamentally different or does it in a sense point the way to where Britain might be heading. And it stands as a reminder that democratic institutions can collapse, that trade union action can overwhelm civil authority, that law and order can break down. So we've got these crises. <coughs> Less existentially, but still importantly, we've got crises over what we might think of as issues of national identity, Britain's place in the world in the aftermath of empire, did Britain's future lie in Europe, or did it lie in the Commonwealth? Did Britain itself have a future at a time when Scottish and Welsh nationalism is starting to become politically potent? And then knitting all of those things together, we've got the idea of a crisis of government, perhaps even a crisis of democracy. Have the tasks of government simply become too large for the state to manage? Can government still impose its will on powerful interest groups? A related question is perhaps can government still carry out the manifestos on which they're elected? The Conservative manifesto in 1970 famously said, we utterly reject the philosophy of compulsory wage restraint. By 1974, the government's central economic strategy is compulsory wage restraint. And it's that that brings it into conflict with the miners. The miners were demanding a substantial pay increase that couldn't be contained within the government's official pay policy. 
When the government declined, they launched a combination of strikes and overtime bans. And we can see in this, in this conflict many of the things I've already been talking about. So it's partly a response to inflation. It's partly about a long-term crisis in the mining industry and the gathering process of deindustrialization. It's partly about a new, more militant temper in the trade union movement. It's worth remembering that before 1972, the National Union of Mine Workers hadn't had an official strike since the 1920s. So again, something here is changing. And in an economy that is still largely powered by coal, the effects are felt in every household and every workplace. So Tom has already mentioned <clears throat> the three day week. And we get images like these appearing in the newspapers. We've got a little girl and her dog doing their homework by candlelight because the lights have gone out. Uh, workers in the office wrapped in duvets because the heating can't work. So this brings together all those elements of crisis. It's about the fear of economic collapse. It's about whether governments can keep the lights on. It's about law and order, which is a term that first appears in a party manifesto in 1974. It's about whether governments can impose their will on trade unions. And all of those things are confronting a governing class that is increasingly exhausted. Ted Heath has a thyroid problem. Harold Wilson is drinking more than is good for him. The head of the civil service has a breakdown. Um, Tim was commenting earlier this week, and you will find this difficult to believe, that he is the same age as Heath and Wilson in this picture, and yet he looks decades younger. You know, this is what <laughs> governing in the 1970s can do to you. So after months of resisting the idea, Heath calls an election on this resonant question, who governs Britain? He's asking for a mandate that will strengthen his hands against the miners. One MP calls it a trade union ballot of the nation. But it's never actually very clear what that mandate would be for. It's not entirely clear how this will change the dynamic of the miners' strike if he wins. And partly for that reason, others can cast the election in very different ways. So Harold Wilson wants to say this isn't about who governs Britain. It's about the economic crisis. And it's about what he sees as the Tories' economic failure. Enoch Powell wants it to be an election about Europe. He sensationally tells his supporters to vote Labour to make sure that they get a referendum. The Liberals want it to be about the crisis of the two-party system. The SNP wants it to be about the crisis of the union. So there's a common theme here of something unravelling, but they're all pulling the threads in different directions. And that might be partly why the result is so indecisive. The result is a hung parliament, first time since the 1920s. Now, it's clearly a bad result for the Conservatives. They lose 28 seats. They record their lowest vote share since 1918. But in many respects, it's also actually a very bad result for the Labour Party. Labour picks up 14 seats, but its share of the vote actually falls. It falls by nearly six percentage points on 1970. Labour actually wins fewer votes than the Conservatives. If we put the two main parties' vote together, it comes to just under 75%, and that was their lowest share since 1923. The Liberals, meanwhile, under charismatic, dog-loving leader Jeremy Ford, <laughs> they win more than 19%, their best result since 1929. But of course, this is first past the post, and they win fewer than 2% of the seats. The SNP and Plaid Cymru break through. This is also the first time that all the MPs elected in Northern Ireland are for Northern Ireland-only parties. So if this election was meant to resolve the crisis in terms of giving clear answers to the questions facing Britain or returning a government with a strong democratic mandate, it almost certainly fails. From the future of the British economy to the relations between governments and trade unions, from the crisis in Northern Ireland to the debate about the European community, the big questions of British politics all remain very much open. They will have to be tackled by this hung, precarious parliament. 
and the one that succeeds it in October. And I'm sure we'll come on to talk more about that for the rest of the evening. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Rob. Characteristically um, brilliant um, setting of the context. And um, now we're going to hear from a couple of people who were there at the time and have, I was going to say fond memories, but at least memories of... Uh, of uh, February 1974, but also that Heath government 1970 to, to 1974. So, uh, Robin, uh, after you, do you want to take one of the Okay, well, I'll uh, try and give you some uh, <coughs> human insights into it. It's extraordinary to me to think that it is 50 years ago tonight that my darling wife, who is here with me, and I had a party at our home for the number 10 private office to see the results coming in. And we expected, and I think an off, perhaps a majority of people expected, that Ted Heath, our boss, would win. And um, when the first result came through, which Vernon Bogdan always reminded me was Guildford, Robert Armstrong, who was the principal private secretary, suddenly the whole joy went out of the party. And he said, I think I'd better go back to the office. It looks as if I'd better be alert tomorrow. Now, first of all, let me just explain what I was doing. Um, I was one of the civil service private secretaries in the number 10 office. There were five of us. And there was Robert Armstrong, who was the principal private secretary. And I had started in 1972 doing parliamentary questions. But from 1973 onwards, I was doing economics, which included uh, the uh, issue with the miners, and uh, Northern Ireland, which was uh, also active at the time. And I started in 1973 uh, pretty well synonymously with the conservative U-turn. And I remember vividly that, that what, there was a secret weekend meeting at Lord Carrington's house at Bledlow. And it was at that uh, time when uh, all the economic indicators were going the wrong way, but principally there was both high unemployment and there was also high inflation. And at that meeting, the Conservatives came to the conclusion, Edward, uh, Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher privately dissenting, that the deal they would offer would be to start expanding the economy in order to bring unemployment down, but to combine it with control of prices and incomes, including a statutory prices and incomes policy. That was the big change. Now, what was it, uh, why did this appeal? But in particular, why did it appeal to Heath? Heath's central dogma, uh, and really from his background in the war, that the success of Britain would depend on government, business, and unions cooperating together, working together. It became uh, called the corporatist approach. And that's what really underlay, I think, this switch to a deal, which was um, business and unions, you control uh, prices, and incomes, and uh, we, the government, will expand the economy. And so that's what was going on. And there was this statutory control on incomes, with which the TUC didn't nominally go along, but the moderates in the TUC, led by Len Murray, uh, would have gone along with it, I think. Uh, and the, Arthur Cofield was the minister and was price of the control of prices. But the NUM weren't having it. They were the dissenting union. And the government did work. It stretched the, um, <coughs> the incomes policy as far as it would go so that the offer to the miners was 15%. And, but this was not enough for the miners. Joe Gormley, who was the general secretary of the NUM, was sympathetic, I think, and his relations with Ted Heath 
were good. But the two militants uh, in the NUM, the leading militants, were Mick McGahey, who was the deputy secretary, and of course, Arthur Scargill. And I have a vivid memory of a meeting when the NUM came into number 10, and there was a meeting in the cabinet room, and I was there as the uh, private secretary with uh, economics, dealing with economics. And I remember, uh, just as a little sideline, um, beforehand, somebody said, God, they're all going to say that the cabinet room is too warm. Can somebody turn off the heating? <laughs> and um, we discovered that the heating actually came in pipes under Whitehall from uh, the Ministry of Defence, and we couldn't turn it off. So uh, that just had to be faced out. But I was sitting facing Arthur Scargill uh, directly. And uh, every time that Heath made a point in favour of the incomes policy, I remember vividly Arthur Scargill nodding his head like that. And uh, the, so the direct appeal to the uh, miners uh, didn't, uh, didn't work. And, but Heath, I think, still um, hoped that there wouldn't be um, a strike and that uh, it would be possible to get through. He did not want to call the uh, election. He still was clinging to the corporatist approach and hoped that the uh, NUN can be persuaded. And again, uh, as was said, uh, his, political, his colleagues wanted to have the election. Um, I think it was, they wanted to have it on Ge the 31st of January. Um, if Douglas heard diary say the 7th of February, then that's probably right. But it was on the 7th of February that the miners' strike was actually going to happen. And I've got, again, a vivid memory of Ted Heath, I think, hoped that the miners could be persuaded to uh, call it off. And uh, what finally convinced him that that was not going to be possible was that there was a ballot among the uh, miners, among the NUM, which went decisively in favour of the strike. And one of the things that I remember about that is that I was on duty as a private secretary and I had to take this result up to Ted Heath in the flat, in his flat at the top of number 10. And I told him it was bad news and that there was uh, a very strong support among the NUM for starting the strike on the 7th of February. And you would not expect me to forget this. He said, well, what can I do now? And I said, going beyond my civil service remit, I think there's only one thing you can do. And of course, what I had in mind was calling a uh, general election. And so uh, he, on the 7th of February, the day on which the NUM started their strike, that was the day on which he called the general election. And he wrote a letter to Joe Gormley even at that last moment, saying there is going to be a ballot, the people are going to vote, they shouldn't be distracted by um, in, uh, an industrial relations dispute. So will you please suspend the industrial action uh, during the period of the election? Um, as it happened, he signed the letter and uh, he then made a drafting um, uh, change to it and he moves the position of one word. And I still have the draft, but, uh, which I have framed at home, uh, and uh, I shouldn't have taken it, but uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't resist it. Uh, and so the um, campaign started, and there was confidence. Uh, the, all the press except the Daily Mirror uh, were supporting the Conservatives, and I think there was a general expectation, as I mentioned, that they would win. And it was a shock uh, when they didn't. And it was a terrible shock to us, the private office, in our home in uh, Herne Hill, uh, when those uh, first uh, results came through. 
There's one other thing I just want to tell you to give colour to this. In, um, and that is the part that uh, the Irish Troubles played in it. The, um, the, the Sunningdale Agreement, negotiated at the Civil Service College at Sunningdale, uh, was in December. And it was expected, because uh, Willie Whitelaw had done the main business with the Northern Ireland parties, that it would be concluded on the Friday evening. That is not how things work out with the Irish. And uh, they went on, and uh, Ted Heath had the other complication that the president of Italy was due to visit him at Chequers. And so the negotiations went on. Ted Heath went by helicopter to Chequers. He came back and um, on the late on Saturday night, and the negotiations were still going on. And they couldn't be suspended so that we could all go to bed because the... You, the unionists said that they couldn't work on a Sunday. They could only work on a Sunday if it was an extension of Saturday. And so we went on through that uh, Saturday night. And the Sunningdale Agreement was eventually reached at 8 p.m. that evening. And it was signed. I remember I got home at 1 p.m. Now, the significance of this is that the very next day, the Monday, Ted Heath had the CBI into dinner at number 10. Heath was absolutely out on his uppers. In fact, he fell asleep during the dinner. And it was at that dinner that they decided to go ahead with the three-day week, which was announced uh, in, in that period in uh, December. I, I just wanted to give you this to give you the um, impression of what a lot of things were going on at the same time, and indeed what pressure there was on the government. But I hope I've characterized Ted Heath's approach, the reason for his reluctance to have the election, and the circumstances in which eventually he was dragged reluctantly into doing it. I'm sure we'll talk a little later about the course which the election campaign took. Okay. So now we're going to hear uh, from the other side, as it were. Um, so, Tom. Yeah. Um, is this working? Yep. Yes. John, good. Well, the first thing is that I, I was thinking, if somebody had said to me in 1974, there's an interesting lecture going on at QM, <laughs> QMC, as we'd call it in those days, Queen Mary tonight, uh, some old boy who was advising the <laughs> Labour government of 2024 is going to be talking. I don't know, I'll give that a pass. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's amazing how times fly. Um, I discovered, or we discovered, at that time, I was International Secretary of the Labour Party, and because of the, the um, Terry Pitt, who was the head of policy the Labour Party was going to fight a seat. I was on um, the election committee um, and I'd also been on a, um, a, joint, a joint secretary um, with the Assistant <coughs> General Secretary of the TUC uh, on the Labour TUC committee uh, which worked out uh, a policy for the Labour Party after the in place of strike attempt to reform the trade unions had collapsed before the 1970 election. Um, interestingly, you know, about election forecasts, um, uh, I was in Transport House the night that Labour lost the 1970 election. And although Harold later said he knew he was going to lose, I don't think he did, and we certainly didn't the party headquarters. <laughs> The election electorate can be very fickle. But Labour did use, one of the interesting things, Labour did use the period in opposition uh, to heal some of the wounds of um, the 1970-64-70 government. And in particular, Jim Callaghan and Jim Callaghan and Harold Wilson worked very closely together in, in hammering out policies to uh, 
address some of the issues, not least the common market. And I think Harold Wilson had to suffer the, uh, the problem of being really the first Prime Minister to have to deal with a party that was fundamentally split on Europe and how to hold it together. Uh, if you pardon Harold's French, he once said, I waded through shit to keep the Labour Party together on Europe. And he did, and he did. Um, and so that we, we had um, the solution to the dilemma about um, uh, the Europe as no to Europe on Tory terms and the promise of a, 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 a referendum. Um, on the economy, um, there was the social contract with the trade unions. The social contract being agreement that the trade unions would show moderation in their um, uh, wage demands in, turn, in return uh, for an agreed program uh, of social reform. And um, so by um, the beginning of the end of 2003-2004, there were rumours of an election. 73 uh, four. sorry. The, um, but I, mean, I think I, I saw the, the, my textbook at, when I was at University College a long time ago on general elections, I always remember started off in Britain, prime ministers usually call elections when they think they can win. And the tr trouble is, they don't always get it right. Um, and calling elections early is perilous indeed. Um, we didn't think in the Labour Party at that time that it would go early. Um, and we were not confident um, that getting shackled with trade union militancy would be good for the Labour Party at all. So one sign of, of how we were expecting or not expecting was the fact that in the week before the election that was called, um, I was in um, the Middle East with Jim Callaghan, um, who was both chairman of the party and shadow, um, international, uh, shadow foreign secretary, meeting Sadat and Golda Meir um, about the fallout from the recent war in the Middle East. And we actually flew back to London um, and were told on the flight that he had left for number 10, the number 10 for the palace. And there's one little anecdote of that which had repercussions later. Um, we got a, a, the pilot sent back a message that there was a lot of press at the airport and would Jim give a press conference? And we talked about this, and I said, this would be a great moment. You, you know, you can speak while he's still at the palace and get the election. And so we gave a press conference at the press co at the um, airport, uh, in which Jim kind of gave the main issues as he saw them for the Labour Party. And we were delighted in the car back from the airport to turn on the one o'clock news, to hear that we were leading to plan a got used with this rallying call from Jim. Um, four years later, <laughs> I was on this plane to <laughs> Guadeloupe with Jim, and we got the same request. And my advice was the same. <laughs> <laughs> and thus was crisis what crisis. So sometimes you can give the right advice and get a good result and get the right advice and get a disaster. <laughs> um, other memories, another memory of this though, with, uh, I, I think the Labour Party was ready for the election. Um, Harold Wilson was never as unpopular with the electorate as the Conservative newspapers thought he was. Harold was a very good campaigner and had a, a a touch with the electorate, uh, which resonated during the campaign. Um, and the Labour Party still had an array of major <coughs> who were in recent memory, a 
be in office uh, and, and were big figures. But the story I want to tell, which is somehow a, a picture of the times, um, the court lent us Jim, for Jim to do this tour uh, of a kind of big figure eight around the country to, to marginals. It was a big court um, funeral car, uh, not a hearse, but, but <laughs> an ample car. And we would toddle off with this um, itinerary of calling points. And on the way, we decided to call in and have a cup of tea at a, 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 a um, roadside cafeteria. And when we went in, in there was Willie Whitehall <laughs> with one protection officer and a, a young woman who was on secondment from the Times acting as his press officer. And um, Jim walked across to Willie and he thought for a few minutes and then Jim came back to me and said, I wonder if you mind just having your, your, your tea on, on your own. He said, uh, I just want to chat with Willie. And so we sat in, in this, um, there were no others in the room, and the protection officer and the girl from the Times was in one corner and I was in the other. <laughs> and Willie Whitelaw and Jim sat there speaking for about half an hour. I have no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> um, but they, we then parted and got in our respective cars and went <laughs> off with the campaign. And I sometimes think, it, you, you had there two men who had ser served in the war, who had some sense of public service and of responsibility. Uh, and it, it was a, a picture that stays with me. Mm. The campaign itself was very interesting. Um, our advisor was, uh, on public uh, on, um, opinion polls was Bob Worcester. And I remember the first meeting we had of the, the small campaign group at the beginning. And Bob, Bob said, um, this, who governs Britain, it will not hold for a whole campaign. Um, I think you're better to stick on, um, well, as Bill Clinton would later call it, the economy stupid. And in fact, if you look back, I remember Jim Callahan having a big basket of groceries for campaign photographs and that. And from the beginning of that campaign, the Labour Party fought it on uh, two issues. One, well, three really. One on the economy. Two, and I forget which was the Labour Party, uh, Labour MP, one of the old Labour MPs said, well, our slogan should be back to work with Labour. And it resonated on a country that was in a three-day three day week. And the third was another backbench wag said, well, if he's asking who governs Britain, it certainly isn't him. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that combination of having to ask the country in virtually midterm for a new mandate and an election campaign fought on an issue, a single issue, which is hard to sustain through the pressures, and the fact that the shopping basket is always a very important uh, in any election campaign. And um, in, in a way, it was a, a, a curious thing, because um, I, I, I'm not sure we expected to win, um, but we didn't. Um, <coughs> It, it was a campaign where the party morale was quite high. You mentioned we only had support from the um, uh, um, Daily Mirror. Um, the Daily Mirror on election morning, I, I, read it. I was living out at Forest Hill at the time. I had to catch an early bus in um, to Transport House. And I had to go down the train and, uh, a train at about six, just after six, and the newspaper shop was open, and the <coughs> Daily Mirror was outside there, and the whole of the front page just said, for all our tomorrows, vote Labour today. And I nearly cried then, <laughs> and I nearly cried on the day. And it, 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 was, it was an interesting result, um, 
because um, as somebody said, it was in the middle of Friday before uh, the final result was in. Um, Harold by this time was back at Transport House and we deciding what, what we were going to do. And we heard that he was talking to um, Jeremy Thorpe, who, may I say, was the factor in the campaign. I mean, um, I'm in the Liberal Democrats now, and, and my one hope is that the Liberals started at 10% at the start of that campaign, roughly about where we are in the polls now as the Liberal <laughs> Democrats. Um, they ended up, as Robin said, at over 19%. Uh, and he, he was a, fl uh, a flamboyant, but a very successful campaigner. I can still remember us thinking, what was he going to do next? When he <laughs> coming up the beach on the hovercraft. <laughs> um, a very successful campaign, which did um, screw the, the, the election result very substantially. Um, but the first thing that said, right, let them get on with it. Nobody says anything. And, and, and um, I think I mentioned the, uh, the one thing, well, what, what would you do with what were the Sunday papers? Uh, Harold said, I'll take Paddy for a walk and we'll have a photo call. And if you look at the papers the other day, none of them could risk a photograph of Paddy, the, which is Paddy, Paddy's dog. Um, and we waited and then. Um, Harold, with his choice of words, called it the, the, the most expensive dirty weekend in British political history. <laughs> and and um, finally, the, the broke, talk broke down. And uh, Harold, rather surprised, I think, in fact, he, I think he was, he was recorded as saying to Gerald Cuff, and I can't believe it, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was back in Downing Street. On the Monday, <coughs> Monday evening. Yeah. So they have, Advice to all your youngsters, don't put your money on the results of a general election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, well, uh, Tom, Tom, if yeah. I may, I just have to qualify what you said in one respect. Ted Heath never went to the palace because the Queen, similarly not expecting a general election, was in New Zealand. And uh, so it must have been done by telephone. Yes. <laughs> uh, so there we are. I thought I'd abuse my position as chairman just to ask the, the, the first question. And I, I guess I'll address it to, to Robin first, but any of you may come in. <clears throat> Given the difficulties that the government had had really from almost day one, because we have to remember, for example, that Ian McLeod, who was um, uh, Ted Heath's pick for chancellor, died very mm -hmm. suddenly, very early on. Uh, in, in that government and was replaced by Anthony Barber, you know, responsible for the Barber boom, etc. We've heard about the difficulties with the trade unions. We haven't actually talked very much about the Conservative Party, which um, really for the first time um, began to collapse in terms of its uh, integrity in Parliament. You, you begin really in the 1970-74 period to see Conservative MPs voting against the government in ways that really had not been seen um, before then. We've got very used to it by now, but uh, it was not the case before then. Uh, so, you know, we had a, a party in, in difficulty, we had a government in difficulty. Why then were people fairly confident that the Conservatives were going to win <laughs> that election? Well, I'm not sure I can um, answer that. I mean, I, as I say, I think the the vast uh, majority of the media were on the Conservative side, and um, I think they, that uh, the Who Governs Britain, which was believed in by the Conservative Party, possibly, as uh, Tom said and Bob Worcester advised, unwisely, that that was an issue which sort of among the uh, chattering classes did, uh, did resonate. Um, so I think that that was why they expected to win. We certainly in the private office, expected them to win. It's just worth mentioning, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, there were two very dramatic moments in the latter part of the campaign. Mm -hmm. One was when the um, Prices and Incomes Board that had put the miners at the top of the pay league of uh, manual workers changed their mind 
and announced that they were lower down. Now, I remember that vividly because Ted Heath was out at an election meeting and we didn't get the news through to him quickly enough, uh, and not as quickly as Harold Wilson. And Harold was onto it and used it straight away. The other was that Campbell Adamson, who was a director general of the CBI, uh, came out against the government's uh, industrial relations uh, reforms. Uh, the government tried to say these were just his personal opinions, but I think those may have been uh, important moments, but that doesn't necessarily answer your question uh, about why we expected to win. The what? The what? Yeah, well, the, yes, I mean, that, Jill says, what about the uh, waiting in washing time? Uh, that was a device to try and get more money for the miners, uh, which the, um, uh, the TUC, Len Murray, pushed, because the TUC were very anxious to try and get the miners through this, and that was one device. Um, they weren't being paid for the time they spent. Washington. That's right. And uh, so uh, the suggestion was that they should get extra pay for waiting and washing. But that actually was thought to be a bridge too far. And it was, uh, uh, and so the government didn't feel that it could go along with that. Okay. Um, actually, Rob, what do you think? Um, well, I think there are perhaps two things that the Conservative Party didn't factor in, and that might not have been an issue in the same way with an earlier mm. election. One is the sheer number of Liberal candidates. Mm. and the money that the Liberal Party is able to mobilise. I think there's a sense that had the election happened in January, the Liberal Party would not have run so many candidates, mm. and that that probably hits the Conservative votes significantly harder than it hits Labour. Uh, so maybe that's part of it. I suppose the other thing, I don't know what, what you think, is the Enoch Powell factor. Mm. That it wasn't a surprise that Enoch Powell was discontented, but I think the fact that he told people to go and vote Labour was a shock. Mm. And if you look at where Labour picks up seats, mm. it's very much in the middle. It's, it's in power country. So there is a sense that that endorsement did actually shift yes. votes in a way that probably did have an impact on the balance of parties. And it's also worth saying, actually, in my nerdy way, um, compared to um, today, we have to remember that that government only lost one by-election to the Labour Party <laughs> between 1970 and 1974, and it was in a West Midland seat, actually, so it probably should have been uh, a warning. It lost, I think, three to the Liberals uh, as well, and that should have been a warning, I guess, to the, to the government that um, you know, perhaps things weren't quite... Uh, as uh, going quite as well for them as, as, as they thought was the case. But it also is worth saying that that Conservative government, it did fall behind Labour in the opinion polls for quite some time during 70 to 74. But actually it was, was not very far behind Labour for most of the time. So it certainly was not in the kind of situation, for example, that we see the current um, Conservative government. OK, so... Um, uh, Tom, any, any thoughts on, on why Labour managed to pull things around, given how divided, as you say, Labour was uh, you know, in, the, in the 60s and, and, in fact, really, till 1972, three, you could say? Yeah, because I think the, the leadership, the chick, uh, I'll put it I think Jim Carhan and Harold Wilson had reached the stage where they thought if they didn't hang together... <laughs> They'd be hung separately, mm -hmm. and they they did work. I I Harold would go. Uh, Jim and I Harold would meet every Friday morning, just the two of them, and talk tactics. And they worked very hard on their various contacts within the party, um, and they managed to, as I say, uh, stitch together a party program, which held the party together and looked coherent as far as uh, an election was concerned. And, um, you know, that, that is the lesson, the eternal lesson of politics, that, that if you can project um, a consistency and a unity, um, the country will listen to you. If you don't, they won't. And, and how much do we all think that the, the personality and the, the projection of that personality of Ted Heath himself played a role in, in, the, in the defeat. Uh, perhaps Robert first? Uh, actually, can I say something about Howard Wilson? You certainly can. Which follows on from what you were just saying. I was 
I was re rereading the, the Nuffield study of the election beforehand, just to prove that we do prepare for these things. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting how much they, they, they talk about the sense that Harold Wilson was off colour in the early part of the campaign. He was not performing as well as he had done the campaign trail previously. And that's clearly true, but I think there is a wonderful line in Barbara Castle's diaries where she comments on the way that Harold Wilson used boredom as a physical technique. And she says something like, when Harold starts droning on in a bored and boring fashion, I reach for my critical faculties. <laughs> and I think one thing that's interesting about the Labour campaign, tell me if you think this is wrong, is that you've got a really radical manifesto. The 74 manifesto talks about an irreversible shift in power and wealth to working people and their families. There's all sorts of material behind it around mass nationalisation. And then you've got this quite boring campaign, usually in front of the Union Jack, with a One Nation slogan over the top. And it's quite an interesting pairing of a sort of dull, reassuring campaign message with a very radical campaign content, which I guess means that different people can see different things in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, you know, that Harold Wilson, by 74, by the time of the election, was beginning to lose it. Um, we, no, I don't, don't mean lose the election. He was, because we know that uh, later he suffered from extreme dementia. And um, I worked for him for that first uh, 18 months after 74, and I saw what, in retrospect, I think the signs of that. And it's always been a speculation about why he um, retired in 1976. And I think that he knew that dementia was coming on. Mm -hmm. So, um, Robin, I mean, I can ask you about Ted Heath's um, role then in the election. I mean, to, to what extent um, was dissatisfaction with him personally uh, in the electorate a, a problem, I think, for the Conservative Party more generally, do you think? I don't think I can, I, I don't think I can comment on that. I was stuck in number 10 while uh, he was out on the campaign tri trail I didn't see any reaction. I don't remember any opinion polls on it. Right. Tom, I mean, yeah, how, yeah, how did I you don't... deal with, with Ted Heath? I mean, was he was he unpopular and an easy target, or? Well, he was, he was unpopular. I don't think there was any kind of hostility to Ted Heath in in the way that um, uh, some uh, <coughs> recent politics has become. <laughs> Um, no, he, he, the fact was, uh, he, he appeared a, a rather stiff, aloof um, uh, uh, figure. Um, but in the end, basically, I think the, 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 there were no kind of personal attacks on him. Mm. Um, the, uh, I, I think the Powell factor again, I mean, the two. He was caught in a pincer movement uh, of, of Powell, uh, a liberal resurgence, and Powell. And, and, and the, the liberals uh, siphoned off uh, the, the middle class vote, and Powell, um, the, the working class vote. Uh, and that, that was enough to, to lose you an election in the position that we were in. But I also think, as well, I'm looking. Back, I'm, I'm being very um, impertinent in front of uh, such academics, but I think we've also got to remember that, that the politicians of this time were having to deal with a, a really seismic change in the British economy. The old economy that had created Britain's wealth the old industrial revolution um, was declining. And when there's that kind of change, you get instability. Uh, it also happens when you get rapid um, technological change, as we are now. But back then, I mean, when I became MP for Stockport in um, 1979, there were still 600,000 people working in the textile industry in uh, Lancashire mm -hmm. and Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. There were 600,000 miners. Mm -hmm. uh, God knows how many the railways back face. 
you know, the big, in, the big industrial employers the, 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 of the economy were changing, and, it, and, and that change was difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so all the politicians, if you look at, you know, for, from, from 70, 74, <coughs> the, 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 the 76 and the IMF, by the way, we only borrowed, borrowed four billion from the IMF and we paid it back in two years. Uh, uh, um, but, but, you know, I, I do think that the, the academics, um, looking around at a few of them, um, have got to take in account yeah. what you are trying to manage, uh, the social management of yeah. that. Yeah. And, and also, I'll go back one, I did a thing like this, oh, God knows how long ago, but, but, but it, it was um, on um, the um, breakdown with the trade unions mm. in, in uh, 78, 79. With, and I did it with David Lee. And the uh, last question was put um, what, to me was, you know, um, what went wrong? And I said, well, what went wrong was the British trade union movement were given the offer of more power, more influence than they'd ever had. But when it came to making the difficult decisions, they bottled it. And David Lee came out of his chair and he said, we told you, we told you we couldn't deliver. We couldn't deliver on the shop floor. And I think that's the other reality. And it's the same reality as, as Ethan. I mean, Joe Gormley, I, Joe was a very, very close personal friend of mine, and Joe believed in corporatism. Yeah. He, he was he got on well with Heath and a number of the uh, uh, others, and, and a lot of the other trade unions. But where they were losing it was on the shop floor, yeah. uh, and it was very yeah. difficult to manage. Yeah. I, I remember Joe Gormley <coughs> saying to Ted Heath, not in the presence of the rest of the executive of the NUM, I can't, I can't, I can't deliver it. I can't get it passed. And the, the people who'd taken over were McGarthy and Scarfield. Mm. Go again. Uh, uh, yes, just, of course. Just on, because I, I think you're absolutely right about thinking about structural economic change underpinning all of this. And a lot of academics, actually, in defense of my profession, are writing about things like deindustrialization mm -hmm. at the moment. But I think that the total number of people employed in coal mining, so not just miners, but all the kind of ancillary industries, Roughly half, so in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about the changed moves in the trade union movements, mm -hmm. and a sense that perhaps not striking haven't worked very well, there are structural reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Encouraging a different temper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I think that is a great place to finish, <laughs> given that we are, are facing an election at the end of the year. I'd like to um, uh, thank, obviously, our speakers, and I'll ask you to do that in a moment. Um, but I would also ask you to join us downstairs for a drink. You might well be able to, I won't say buttonhole, but um, <laughs> ask the speakers the question that you might not have got the chance to ask in uh, uh, this kind of plenary environment. So if I could ask you to thank uh, Lord Ali, Lord Bunnell. <laughs>